And uh, captions are there if anyone would like to use them. Um, so good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Claire Bradley and uh, I am taking today's virtual meeting on DNA. Um, now, I don't know where everyone is in their DNA journey. Uh, God, I'm sorry for using that word um, in their in their research with DNA. Um, and obviously, um, people will have a different experiences of it. So what I thought we would do today is we'd have a look at the third party tools website, DNA Painter. Has everyone has anyone not or has anyone seen DNA Painter before? Lacey, you have. OK, um, so I use it quite a lot. And when I was at Roots Tech last month, I was very fortunate to get a, a demo from Johnny Pearl, who does uh, whose whose website it is on the new version of their What Are the Odds tool, which is called Watto Plus. Um, so I thought we would take a look at that, and we'll take a look at a couple of other things that you can do on the website. Um, so let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, so you should be able to see this now. Um, so the first thing to say is that there's now two versions of Watto on the website, the old version and the new version. And you can use um you can use both of them. So you can you can download what you have in one version and you can uh, upload it to the new version and let it run the hypotheses and you can use them to see how they work. But the new version is a little bit more streamlined. And I think the feedback had been that a lot of people struggled to uh, create the question section uh, for Watto. So the idea is that you've got a mystery uh, that you want to use DNA to solve, and this is using autosomal DNA. And so they now ask you to formulate the question. So uh, what you do when you when you start, I've created a tree already, and I should say that this is an anonymized tree. It is not uh, real uh, names or anything like that. Um, so what I've said here is I am trying to identify the biological father of someone called Mary Holland. And when I'm formulating this question, it will allow me to select father or mother in that option. And then I say that she was born in the year, whatever year. So in this case, I've said 1934. And I'm using the DNA matches of Mary Holland's child, Elaine. So uh, I might, of course, be using Mary Holland's own DNA and I can select that or I can say their grandchild, something like that. And so what I have selected here is I've got a number of matches to a family who are called Neely. And this man, Connell Neely, had two wives and he had children with both of those wives. So the first wife died young. He had two children with uh, the first wife who were called Barry and Timothy. And then he had several more children with the second wife. And here I have only included some of them because many of them were born after the point where they would be too young to be Mary's parent. And we know that we're looking for Mary's dad, not Mary's mom. So I have excluded all of the girls in the tree, except ones where we have some DNA matches. And so uh, uh, Connell's daughter, Bridget, and Connell's daughter, Annie, both provided DNA matches in this scenario. So we had someone called O'Connell O'Shea, who was Bridget's son and Connell's uh, grandson. And he shared 297 centimorgans with Elaine. And uh, then there was somebody who was, I could work out, he was Connell's first cousin once removed, sorry, his nephew, um, and he shared 147. And then there was a pair of brothers and they actually came from two different databases. So Michael Kelly was in uh, the MyHeritage database and uh, Connell was in Ancestry. And this shows the importance of making sure that you're looking at the DNA matches uh, on all the different websites when you're trying to solve a mystery. So, um, in fact, Michael never responded to my messages at all, but Connell did, and he confirmed that Michael was his brother. So they had uh, slightly different numbers, but but in the same range. Um, and they were my only matches that were of use to me at this point. Um, I did have somebody else who was a match to Connell's first wife's brother's child uh, or that's who she was and that slightly edged the the scenario for me so basically there was two boys born to the second couple the second marriage who were in the mix but I didn't have any DNA uh, matches for the children of those people 
and I had uh, two boys in the second, um, in the first marriage, and they were older. And again, I don't have any DNA matches to those people. So um, the first thing to say is that I've, I've put together this hypothesis and it has suggested some for me. So, so it's saying, okay, Barry could be the father, Timothy could be the father, John down here could be the father, and so could Nick. And it's giving percentage matches. So it used to, the old Watto, if you remember, used to show relative numbers. So if something was possible, it would say one, and then say there was another possibility and it was more likely, it might say that it was 27. And what that meant was that it was 27 times more likely than the, the next one down. Um, and so sometimes you get very large numbers. You might get something that was, I saw one once that was 69,753 times more likely than the one below. And I thought, oh, that's a good, there's a good chance that's the right one then. Um, but now it's giving it in percentages, which is clearer, I think. Um, and so it's also saying that we have another possibility, which is that there's another unknown half, uh, another unknown half sibling here uh, in the mix. And uh, and he is 24 percent. So there, the, the two boys who were born to the first marriage are very slightly more likely than the two boys born in the second marriage. But an unknown child is still just as possible. So what this really says to me at this point is that we don't have enough information to make an, an, a full assessment yet, because we could come along, get a child of Barry. Um, I should say that three of these men in, in the mix have known children and uh, some of them are alive. Uh, one of them, uh, Timothy here, he seems to have uh, left Ireland and we don't know who he, where he went or anything like that. So no idea about what happened to him. Um, but it might be possible to get targeted DNA tests done on some of these people. Now, of course, it's quite sensitive because you're saying to them, you know, your dad might have had another child. Now, it doesn't look to me like it would have been before these people got married. Or sorry, it would have been before they got married. So we're not looking at a situation where someone is going to be upset that their father had an extramarital relationship. Um, but uh, it's still a sensitive thing to contact someone and say, uh, would you do a DNA test on the off chance that your dad had another child that you didn't know about? Um, so but but the, the problem here is that we could we could get a DNA, say we could get a, a child of Barry to do a test and that test, they're going to match. Elaine, because we know that we're in the right family, but it's how much do they match, um, and what do they, uh, and how does that change the uh, analysis? Because if I was to say, okay, I'm going to put in a child here of Barry, so say add child, and I'm going to add a match amount, and say I add the match amount, we'll just put a big amount in there. See how that changes it entirely. Because I've picked something that is in the range for a half, uh, for a, an uncle or an aunt. So it's now saying, if that's if that's what you've got there from that person, well, the other things aren't possible at all anymore, and it has to be Barry. Um, but if we take if we take that down to a different level, it says take it take it down to six hundred. It changes things again. So you see how any one change to these things dramatically changes it. Um, another point I want to uh, uh, point out about this new version of Watto is um, that there's much more down the page. And now there actually always was more down the page, but um, what they were finding was that people weren't looking at it. So down the page, they have this, if you see up here on the right, they have this little uh, menu. So it encourages you to scroll down and go, hang on, what's there? So it gives you a rank of the hypotheses. So let me just take out that child again. So it goes back to what we had. Um, and it says, um, this is possible. This is possible. And then it says that this one has a, the, the hypothesis three that there's another child we don't know about is about two times more likely than the next one down, which is this one. And then we've got this one. So, and then he said, there is actually another really tiny chance of something else being different. Um, and how we're basing that information. So it's saying you've got this person and these are the relationships to these people. And is it possible? What are the odds of these things? Uh, and so on. And then it's basing that, showing you the combined odds ratio. 
So it's it's nicely detailing for you. Um, and it says, again, this new version of Watto makes clearer and better suggestions. Um, and it it will tell you if the, you know, this if extra information can be put in that will will guide you. So for example, up here, you see here it says possible next steps. Find more people in this tree to test. The more data, the better it goes. In particular, there are no tested descendants of these lads here, and this could really change the analysis. Additional research, who might have been in the right place in 1934? And so we're using the father's age. We're not using the mother's age because um, what they might be doing there is, is looking at how old was Mary's mother in relation to the other people. But of course, we know that age doesn't always come into it. Uh, I remember a case I worked on a few years ago where we had figured out who the father was and we looked at in, in the other family who were the women who were approximately the same age as him. We thought, oh, maybe it'll be this woman here. And then in the end, it turned out to be a woman who was um, much younger. She was 14 or 15 years younger than him. And, um, you know, if you were just going in ages, you probably would have ruled that person out. But but that was what had happened. So so this new version um, really um, allows you to, and you see here, I can put in the mother's age if I want to by uh, clicking on edit and putting a valid birth in birth year for the biological mother under uh, optional info. So if I say the birth mother was born, she was born in 1912 and save. Um, it doesn't actually make any change dramatically to it in this case. Um, so I I think this new version is a clearer, better version, um, but it's still more or less giving me the same analysis because I don't have enough information in it. Um, so that is one, one particularly good tool that they have on DNA Painter. This site is a subscription site, but they allow you to do a certain amount for free. And then if you want to subscribe, it costs it's $50 or something like that, $60. It's very small for the year, I feel. I use it all the time professionally in my work these days. Um, to hop over to a couple of other things that they have on the website, and you've probably seen this before, and I have actually got, uh, you can't see it now because I'm sharing my screen, but I've got a poster of it on my wall. So this is the Shared St. Morgan uh, project, which was created by Blaine Bettinger, and, and then the interactive version was done by Johnny. Now, the latest update is still is four years ago, but Blaine is working on a new version of it at the moment. He's actively recruiting people to fill out forms and give him crowdsourced data. So if you don't know, he has asked people who know a shared relationship with a DNA match, is, which is proven, to send in, oh, this is my second cousin twice removed and we share 90 centimorgans or whatever. And from that, he has been able to create a range of centimorgans shared for every relationship and an average. Um, and I think the averages are very good. I've, I've got my mother tested. We match at 3,483. So this right back on, on the average there. Um, my brother and I match very much into where's we're siblings there. Yeah, we we're right in this range as well. Um, to something like 2,480. Um, so it's it's very important tool. But what's very nice about this, and I use this all the time, is when I see a match on, say, Ancestry, and it says, we think, oh, second to third cousin. I don't take Ancestry's word for it. I come here and I put in the amount. So if, if it says, we'll say, for example, let's say 340. And um, what it's saying is, assuming no pedigree collapse or endogamy, which are two slightly different things um, where you have uh, ancestors in the same place in your tree or people who are more than one set of your ancestors, um, it's saying that for a match of 340 centimorgans, then probably you're looking at someone who's related to you on a three times great grandparent level and descended from them. So there's a 50% chance that the person is one of these relationships. But there's also a 46% chance that it's one of these relationships. And there's still even a chance that it's one of these relationships. So there's a lot of options for that number. When you go higher, there's much, uh, let's take uh, 905. Um, there's a much less, um, a much more pronounced category. And so here, if you've got 905 centimorgans shared, there is a 98% chance that you're one of these relationships. And I want to point out that do not forget about half relationships. You know, we you know we see nine hundred and five. You're going to gravitate to first cousin there almost certainly, um, because most people are not going to be uh, DNA matching with people who are their great grandparents. Although they may well be matching with their great grandchildren, 
um, who are still children. Um, sometimes people have tested their children as well. Um, or they might be a great uncle or an aunt or a great niece or a great nephew, but do not rule out these half relationships. Uh, a case that I just worked on and solved, someone who presented as a first cousin on ancestry turned out to be her half uncle. His, uh, his father had had an extramarital relationship which had produced a half brother that he had not known about. And so there are always possibilities. And remember what it's saying here, the connection may be closer. So um, it could be someone who's younger than you that you're not thinking of. So uh, what there's something very nice about this. So I, so I like to put these into my reports. Um, you, can, you can say click for a shareable link and it, it in the URL it goes up and it says now this is 905. And then I, I do a little copy of this and I put it into my report for people to see. There's another version of this, which is, where's it gone? No, where's it gone? Yes, so this. So um, you can do two, per, two people who are the same generation. So say, for example, uh, you and your sister have taken a DNA test and you both match an unknown individual at a reasonable level. But one of you matches at 250 centimorgans and the other one matches at 309. It will show you what's possible for both of those together. So it allows you to take the fact that you're both the same generation. So it would also work with people who were your first cousins. Um, and they have a really good explainer um, on this here. Where is it? There's something on this. See blog post by Blaine Bettinger about how to use this new version. Um, so uh, this is a very nice way of saying it, it helps you rule out more of the relationship possibilities by using two people who are the same generation as each other, which I think is very nice. Um, has anyone used this at all yet? No? Okay, so I also want to show you, so there's a lot, obviously the, the main function of this website is that there's a lot of tools and we're not going to go into the chromosome painting element of it today, but you can do very nice uh, chromosome painting in um, chromosome maps and they look very pretty. So here's one for me that I'll show you. Um, and this is where you take segments of your DNA and how they match and you paste them in to a chromosome browser and whether they're on your mother's side or your father's side. And then you can then over time, the idea is that you can then say, okay, here are people who match me and they match uh, other people um, in that. Uh, so you can extract DNA that comes from specific ancestors is basically where that's going. But um, it takes a lot of work to do that. So I also want to show you that you can build trees. So this is my father's direct ancestor tree. And um, you can upload a GEDCOM for this. You don't have to build it yourself, but it does very nice little things with, with colors um, and breaks things down. It shows you very nicely where is, where's missing and where's not. And what I like about it, it that's relevant for DNA is uh, you can ask it to show you the path. And so sometimes people get very confused about what X DNA is. And what I think is very nice, so, so both men and women have X DNA. And for men, they get their X DNA from their mother, and then they could have gotten it from a number of different people in the ancestry of their mother. So for example, here he's gotten it from his mother, Evelyn, but she got two X chromosomes because she was a woman and she got one from her dad, which came unchanged from his mother. And she got one from her mother, which would be a combination of many of her female, uh, many of her ancestors. So um, it shows you, if you've got someone, uh, say you're looking on family tree DNA, where it nicely shows you if you have an X match with one of your DNA matches um, and you say, oh, hang on. Okay, dad's got an X match with this person here. Well, you can go, OK, so automatically I know I'm ignoring his whole male line side. And this tells me which people in his tree will have given him the X uh, possibility of a match. So we know that the new match can't come from, for example, this Riley line because he wouldn't have X DNA from there. Um, if you're doing it for, um, uh, it also shows you the ones that are a little bit more obvious. So it'll show you the Y DNA path of, of a line, which is your father's 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 line, of course. And it will show you your mitochondrial DNA path, uh, which is your mother's 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 line. But because women and men inherit X differently, just to show you, this is this is me. Um, and so this is my tree, which is a little bit more developed because I'm a younger generation. Uh, and I can put in my X path here and see how there's a much broader spectrum for a woman of where you might get the X 
uh, match with. So for my dad, it's actually still showing, the, on my dad's side, it's showing the exact same thing as we saw on his tree. So the, the same people again. But over here, of course, it is also coming from my mother's side. And uh, apart from my uh, my mother's father's paternal line, I could have xDNA from a whole lot of other places in my tree. So this is a really helpful tool for mapping it out. Now, you can, of course, get templates online that help you do this. But what I like about using it on DNA Painter is that I just upload my GEDCOM, say who is the direct ancestor, the, the person whose direct ancestry I want to look at. And then I can just say, put in this filter for me. And it shows me precisely who is and isn't in the mix for it, which I think is very cool. And um, there are also other little things you can do with these trees that are nice. You can you can make them into a fan. You see, um, and you can get it to produce it as a text if you want. Um, I tend to like the the more traditional version. Um, and then they also have this very nice thing, which is um, for nerds really. Uh, which is um, how much of your tree have you got uh, completed? Um, they're kind of gamifying it. So, um, this is my tree. Um. I've got 88% of my three times great grandparents identified. The four that I do not have identified are my brick wall. And then um, what you see there on the next line is where we the records drop off a cliff in Ireland, um, which is the for my for me, the four times great grandparents generation. Um, I have 20 out of the 64 identified, but many of those 20 are actually not Irish. There, I have lines that are not from Ireland and they are in that those lines that I've got them. And then everybody else practically is not Irish. Um, if you are to go to um, a younger generation, this is my niece's tree. Uh, look at how different it looks. Uh, we go to the four times great grandparents. I was able to identify nearly all of them for her. So it's a fun um, it's just a fun little thing. And I, what I like to do every now and then is track it and, and go back and um, look at it again to see how have I progressed with that since the last time I did it. So I just take a little screenshot of it, much the, like I like to take a screenshot when there's a new ethnicity update on one of the websites, because I like to see, oh, have I Norway this time or not Norway this time or, or Sweden hops in and out for me and, and things like that. So um, it's just nice to compare them and it's a nice reminder for people that those things can change quite a lot. Um, so I'm doing a lot of talking and I'm aware that uh, other people are not doing a lot of talking. Does anyone have any uh, questions or comments? And of course, it doesn't have to be about DNA Painter. Um, you know, if you have something you want to discuss in one of your own DNA research, please go ahead and, and let me know. We're all quiet. Um, are you all taking the DNA courses at the moment? You're not. What about you, Julie and Heather? I've taken two. You've taken two. So I'm working on updating them as well. Um, I'm finishing off the Irish updates first, and then I'm going to go on and uh, update the DNA ones. Which ones have you taken? I did the introduction and the autosomal. The autosomal. And Heather said so you've just finished the intro course as well. So I've actually just updated the intro course, but we I don't think we have it. Uh, there's an edit process after I do my work and then it gets gets updated onto the website. Um. So and how did you find the autosomal course, Julie? It was OK. Yeah, I still have. I haven't done any. I haven't done any testing, so okay. it's hard to it's hard to put things into perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and and really, you know, you're you're reading through it and you're you're working through the, the questions and so on. But it there's no um it that's no it's much better to be looking at your own DNA and working on it and so on. And particularly when you've got, you know, a problem like endogamy or something, I um you have to have the DNA of someone who has endogamy to help you work on it and learn from it. Um no, that's no problem, Heather, understood entirely. Um yeah, so I like to um, read something that's in the course material and then go, OK, can I find a, an example of this in my own DNA matches to um, to analyze on the same level? So it might be a problem. It might be uh, working on a, an unknown parentage. It might just be trying to figure out who someone how someone is related to you. Um, 
And there's so many different ways to do that. Um, and and this is where what I was talking about using Watto really comes in handy because, so of course, we know that lots of DNA matches never reply to you, um, that you send them a message. And it's a bit like shouting into the wind. You kind of hope that they're going to respond and that they'll have heard, oh, you said you've got McMahon. I've got McMahon as well um, or whatever. Um, but but if they've got a little bit of tree, I go off, I do my own research on their tree. Sometimes I expand it. I had a man uh, who matched me at a really small level, sort of 30 centimorgans, but he had a bit of a tree and one of his uh, grandparents had the name Bradley. And I thought, oh, well, I'm familiar with that name. And uh, so I researched it and it turned out that his uh, people were in Massachusetts where they have really excellent records and even better than excellent records, excellent records online. And um, I was able to identify that his grandmother was actually um, the niece of my two times great grandfather. And I had her on my tree and she had been orphaned when she was a teenager and I didn't know what had happened to her. And it turned out she moved to America and uh, grew up and got married and had many children and many descendants. And this man was her grandson. Um, and so he never actually replied to my message, but I did send him a second message saying, hello, I figured out how we're related. Um, and I used... Watto to help me model it. Now the records are really helpful there, but I still took the time to put in a tree on Watto and go, okay, does this work? You know, and it was a small match. So, you know, you have to be careful with small matches when they're when they're under 30 centimorgans, there's a chance that, you know, something might be not right. It might be a false match. It might be you just by chance have a same bit of DNA. And that particularly so when you get under 20 centimorgans and when you're researching DNA in Ireland, we have the problem that people um the records don't go far enough back to help us confirm matches. So I have a big cluster of people who match me in Australia and they match everyone on my dad's side that's tested. And we have a very good hypothesis of how we're related, but there are no records going back far enough in in Ireland, in Dublin, where um where my family was and where this man's family originated. Um, for us to be certain of our hypothesis. Um, but that's still, it's still, so I don't put those people into my tree. I have them in a separate tree going, I'm pretty sure this is how these people are related, but we can't prove it unless we get the time machine, which is of course a much later advanced course in the uh, DNA strand of, of what we can offer you here at the school. Um, it's a secret, a secret after you've taken all the DNA courses, we have the secret build a time machine course. I'm, I'm joking, of course. Um, so um, we're almost coming up to the end of our time. Does anyone have any questions um, that they want to um, throw at me or any comments before we finish today? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope you have a, a lovely rest of your day and a nice Easter. And um, my virtual class for the Irish Studies will be happening um, on Saturday week. And that will be going ahead as usual. And uh, look forward to seeing you then, hopefully. So thanks for joining this evening and uh, have a, a good day. Bye. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Julie. Bye.